Thank you so much for invitation. Thank you, and I'm very honored to be amongst such a distinguished panel and distinguished audience. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my journey, how I got into uh, this field. So as you know, you know, Iranian Revolution, some of us left. Um, I made it to America, I was 16. And I wanted to be a good son. Father's Day is coming up, and I heard that I need to be a doctor since I was born from my dad, who's a surgeon. <laughs> and so becoming a doctor was part of, became part of my DNA. It's epigenetics, I guess, somehow it works. Um, so I made it to medical school, and thinking, of course, I'm going to be a surgeon. And I remember third year medical school, I had this patient that uh, had GI bleeding, was bleeding through the gut, out of the rectum. And this went on for two, three days. We gave the patient, I believe, 27 units of blood. And I was a medical student. Patient was uh, scoped from up, down, everywhere. We gave blood, blood, blood. Patient blood pressure was falling down. And patient was too sick to go to surgery. And somebody had this idea to call this radiologist to come in and see the patient. So this guy came in Friday night, 8 p.m., did this quick procedure, went from the growing a hole, only a few millimeters, no cuts, no stitches, found a bleeder, which is, this was not that same patient, but similar to a little bleeder, put little things there, went home, said patient is not going to bleed anymore. I was like, wow, who was this guy? I want to do that. And yes, he was a radiologist, which was very surprising to me. So this whole field of image-guided surgery or interventional radiology was a disruptive technology in medicine. Now it's established, it's everywhere. But disruptive technology is something that displaces an established technology and shakes up the industry or a groundbreaking product that creates a complete new industry. Um, so slowly interventional radiologists uh, I mean, and some of the examples of disruptive technology in high tech is obviously personal computing, Windows, operating system, email, cell phones, smartphone phones, and social networking that we all can't imagine our lives without it. So imaging became a big part of medicine, as we heard, and it has infiltrated many industries and many parts of medicine. So today, we can, in interventional radiology and endovascular surgery, we can treat brain aneurysms. We can tra uh, treat aortic aneurysms. We can tra treat many cancers, uh, clots in the legs, varicose veins, urine fibroids, almost any bleeding anywhere. We, we can open up clogged arteries. We can close them. We can fix blockages in different tubes, ureters, bile ducts, different places. We can numb pain, we can go in with imaging, close and uh, destroy pain centers. We can biopsy or drain any abscess almost anywhere. And all of it through a hole not more than few millimeters. Um, my suturing skills are probably still worse than a third year surgery resident because I don't need to suture anything. We go through little holes. And all that is in collaboration with every other specialty. Um, as you have heard, great speakers and great talks. We all work together for the best, um, to do the best for the patient. And even interventional radiology has, divided, has been subdivided to three different fields, interventional radiology, neurointerventional radiology, and now interventional oncology, which concentrates on treating cancer patients. So my field has pretty much become neurointerventional radiology, and the great, one of the great advances in that is treatment of stroke. If, as you know, if somebody has a heart attack, everybody understands it. There's a clogged artery in the heart. Somebody goes, you go to the hospital, somebody goes quickly to the heart and opens up that blood vessel. Treatment of stroke has been lagging way behind for that. Treatment of stroke up till 1995 consisted on doing nothing or question of should we put the patient on heparin or no heparin, and basically to pray. There was patient was, you know, sent home maybe on aspirin if they had a mini stroke. So types of stroke, a little bit about um, 
hemorrhagic stroke or some people cause, uh, call aneurysmal stroke as hemorrhagic stroke. So some of the brain aneurysms, now the way we treat, we go through that little hole in the groin, we go all the way in the brain, and we treat these aneurysms, we fill them up with something with coils or different materials. And patient gets a Band-Aid in the groin. Uh, I've had patients that woke up afterward and uh, they were told that somebody fixed their brain aneurysm through a little hole and they asked me afterward, did you go through my ear, my nose, they can't find the hole that you went through and I showed them the Band-Aid in the groin. This is uh, another sample patient, there's a brain aneurysm here, there's a big um, ball, the big bubble that comes out of the blood vessel. And similar to a bubble gum, as this gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it pops and causes devastation. So this patient going through with catheters, wires, we can fix that aneurysm completely, um, usually within an hour, and take care of this aneurysm. These um, have, again, changed significantly the field of vascular neurosurgery, and we have become partners in that with our surgical open colleagues. Um, another thing that has changed significantly is ischemic stroke. That probably has had more of an effect and is gonna have more of an effect in everybody's lives, is uh, if a blood vessel gets blocked, like here we have a blockage in the carotid artery, in the internal carotid artery, and we have placed a stent here, and we use these filters to catch the debris that as you break this by force, the debris gets caught on these filters. And again, you see here blocked you know, vessel in the subclavian artery or vertebral artery that we put stents to restore the flow to the brain. A lot of devices that we play with, um, a lot of them, I'm lucky that they're built and manufactured or designed right around where, where we live in uh, Silicon Valley, besides being IT center of the world, I think a lot of the devices I use, probably 50% of them are built right there. So it's great uh, opportunity to be involved at a groundbreaking part with these devices and kind of help design them, some of them. So if you look at a blockage in the blood vessel in the brain, let's say there's a thrombus form, sometimes there's a tear in the blood vessel that causes a blood clot formation and sometimes this causes a blockage of that vessel. We have learned that if we restore the blood vessel, restore the blood supply to the brain, patient does better. So good outcomes we can get if we restore the blood flow to the brain compared to bad outcomes, and the mortality goes significantly less if we restore the flow to the brain. Now how common is stroke? Stroke is actually more common now in the developed world than heart attacks. Uh, as the patient population ages over 75, stroke becomes more common than heart attacks, uh, MI. So it's a huge burden on society. It's number one or number two cause of disability in most of the world, having a stroke. So um, what changed this whole field was in 1995, this medication, IVTPA, became approved for treatment of became available for treatment of stroke. In US, it got FDA approval in 1996. It's a medication that you give intravenously to the patient and hopefully we dissolve the clot in the brain and patient does better. But only 8% of patients are eligible for that when they come in to the hospital. By the time they come in, it's too late most of the time. Now, I was a fellow at UCSF um, when we did this patient, which was one of the first patients done in the world of this 32-year-old gentleman, 31-year-old that came in, there was a clot in his basilar artery, which is occluding the top of the basilar artery. Patient was in a coma by the time patient came in. And about 90% of these people die when you have an occlusion of your basilar artery. So we grabbed this device that it was just fresh off the shelf and sterilized and we were part of a clinical trial. We grabbed the clot, pulled it out, and patient did great. He was talking on his cell phone next day on the floor and had no idea that how lucky he was. So this started kind of these device manufacturing and uh, technology to try to remove the clots, go to the brain. And by then we, have, we had good enough devices that we could make it all the way to the brain. We could 
make sometimes three 360 turns all the way to the brain to go from the groin to get there within a few minutes. Now, what are the options for if somebody has a stroke is uh, medical management, which is available, which didn't do much, is intravenous TPA, which is getting the IV medication, and this opened the door to endovascular um, treatment, similar to the cardiologist, again, going to the brain, pulling the clot out. Now, I have to say, this is, for most part, still hasn't come to UK. This is, I don't think, available many places if in this country yet. And part of it is the whole medical system that you have to prove this before, and it's a top-down um, kind of system, has to be budgeted and stuff. And this, recently, in 2015, there were a few papers that proved that this works. And I'm sure it's going to be quickly changing um, the whole system here. So what we are trying to achieve is there's a clot in the brain. You see an angiogram of the brain. The left middle cerebral is occluded. And we go to the brain and try to pull this clot out. And hopefully, we do it fast enough and get uh, restoration of the symptoms. Just a sample patient. Uh, this was an elderly female, came in. We did a quick angiogram. And this is what an angiogram looks like from a left carotid artery. That blood comes up and wants to get to the brain, but it's occluded. Nothing goes up to the brain. This is a piece of clot that we removed. This is one of the earlier generation of devices that we use. And this is immediately afterward. We restored the flow to the left side of the brain. Hello, and this afternoon. is the patient um, next morning in the ICU, Hi. completely Any intact. And you have to understand, no. these people with a Can complete a MCA, ICA occlusion, Can more than 50% die. 50 to 70% of them don't make it okay. if you don't restore the flow. And Can you raise your arms, both arms? And hold them upward, yeah, like you're holding a big pizza tray. So, <laughs> um, so, it was difficult to prove that any of this works. We knew it works. A lot of centers in the country and the world have were doing this, but we were not getting paid by insurance companies in U.S. and systems like, you know, uh, British system were not paying for it because there was no proof that it works. Um, all the trials were negative all the way till last year. There was many reasons why they didn't show any benefit. And turning point was technology. They had newer, better devices that came out. And then finally, in 2015, four papers came out in New England Journal of Medicine and other papers, other journals that proved that this is beneficial and significantly beneficial. Uh, Mr. Clean was a trial out of Netherlands that it was a clean study, perfectly designed and um, done. And the good thing about it was every single stroke patient in the country was enrolled in this, in this trial. So everybody went to a center. Everybody got randomized, two to one. I believe it was two to one. Um, and the results were great. The control group compared to the intervention group, 75% got uh, revascularized and seven times more likely that that vessel would be open. There was another trial, SCAPE. Revascularization was significantly more than the control group. And being independent at 90 days is what we use in neuroscience for results for stroke for most part. And 53% independence compared to 29% independence at 90 days, which is huge. A quantum leap for this, for patients with stroke. Uh, another paper proved the same thing. In intervention group were 60% independent compared to 35%. Another paper proved the same thing, rate of revascularization. And every talk has to have a busy slide. So uh, just summary of some of the st studies that were out there. IMS3 and MR Rescue didn't prove that our results were better. However, more recent papers, four of them came back to back that showed intervention arm, much better independence rate compared to the control arm. Um, so we have been publishing and going to conferences and showing our results. I just want to show this one um, paper that we just presented that we looked at octogenarians, people over 80 years old, that a lot of studies, a lot of uh, papers and uh, when we enrolled in many of these trials, they excluded them. Anybody over 80, they wouldn't even enroll. They thought it was too late for them. 
Uh, so the first group, the first chart, actually, let me show you this. Uh, MRS is Modified Ranking Scale and talks about the rate of independence or how good the patient actually functions. So MRS 6 is patient is dead. MRS 0 is most of us in this room. You're completely independent. And MRS 0, 1, 2, you're independent. Around MRS 3 is when you need a little bit of help. So somebody has to help you dress, or you have to go to the bathroom, or you can't do your computer, you can't get on your Facebook account. Um, so the first group is here, the ones that we were not able to revascularize the patients. None of them were independent at 90 days, over 80-year-olds. So when we looked at our last eight years, me and my partner, uh, we had 70-some patients enrolled in this. The ones, if we could not open the vessel, none of those patients were independent. Now, the last group is the last few years with better technology that if we open the blood vessel, close to 50% of our patients were independent. These are over 80-year-olds. These are 85-year-olds, some of them 95-year-olds. And interestingly, the way I like to look at this, which um, most of stroke uh, practitioners don't look at it, and I think we should, is almost exclude the dead patients. Because when I talk to the families, they want to know if their family member lives, what is the chance of them being independent. And so I would like to tell them that, that if I do this, your father, your mother, your grandfather st is living, what's the chance of them being independent? And that's about 65% of those patients will, will be independent if they make it. So there's a huge challenge here. Time is the biggest challenge because you only have few hours to do this. It's gonna to be too late. So how to get the patients to the right hospital? You have to have some hospitals that have all these capabilities. You need neurosurgery, neurointerventional, neuro ICU, neurointensivist, a lot of people on call 24 seven to come in and do this. Uh, in US, uh, Joint Commission has created three types of hospitals. Some of them are stroke-ready hospitals, some of them are primary stroke centers, and recently, comprehensive stroke centers. We were lucky to be one of the first hospitals, one of the, f uh, pretty much one out of the first five hospitals in the country to be primary and the first community hospital to be comprehensive in 2002. So, but the challenge is still exists because at least the US is a huge country and it's hard to get the patient to the right place quickly. So where are we with uh, current affair of uh, state of affairs for stroke? That problem with IVTPA, and that's what's offered today in a lot of places, including uh, UK, is only three to four percent of patients receive treatment. And the potential for large number of stroke victims will not be realized unless patients make it to the correct hospital that can treat the stroke patients after the first few hours or with bigger strokes that have a big clot in the brain. So we need to organize better, have the correct hospitals and transfer systems. And a lot of patients get taken to the wrong hospital presently that don't do any of this. And the window is over by the time you get transferred to another place. Um, at a video that I don't think it's gonna work. So I uh, looked at NHS and still it's not there talking about any of this. Um, but I think the way of the future is having EMS, paramedics, ambulance system to take all the patients to the correct hospital. And if they end up in the wrong hospital, to have a very fast transfer to the hospitals that can do this. And few places have put an ambulance, ambulances uh, have um, put CTs in ambulances that does the CT scan initially before patient gets to the hospital, the whole team gets called in. So in my hospital, we have four staff, two nurses, two techs, anesthesiologists, and myself that show up to the hospital within 30 minutes. And hopefully we won't lose stroke patients to the wrong places. And thank you very much.